All right. Well, let's get going then. Um, I would like to welcome all of you to this evening's webinar. I'm Bob Trug. I'm director of the Center for Bioethics at Harvard Medical School. And for Black History Month, our center is joining with Dr. Reuben Warren and his colleagues at the National Center for Bioethics and Research and Healthcare at Tuskegee University in a respectful celebration of Black History Month. So during the month of February, we will be co-hosting a seminar each Wednesday evening at 6 p.m. This is uh, part of a now two-year collaboration between our two centers uh, at Harvard and Tuskegee and the second year that, it, that we have worked together uh, for Black History Month. So uh, actually we could have the logistics slide. So before we start, just a couple of comments about logistics. Please use the question and answer, the Q&A box to send questions for the panelists. Please use the chat box for any questions that would go to our producer, uh, Ms. Ashley Troutman. And then uh, just to say for security reasons, uh, information in the chat box will only be visible to the panelists and the moderators this evening. And then we can go to our next slide, Ashley, on our upcoming events. Um, so I'd also like to draw your attention to the upcoming sessions for the next three Wednesdays in February. Next Wednesday, uh, Professor Vanessa Northington Gamble will be speaking on a fascinating moment in black history with a lecture entitled, Educated in a White Space, African-American graduates of the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania from 1850 to 1925. On February 16, we will host a session that will focus on the experiences of healthcare students at predominantly white and historically black colleges and universities. And finally, our session on February 23rd will address well-being and healing for future generations focusing on mental health and well-being in predominantly Black communities and institutions. Before I turn this over to my friend, uh, Ruben Warren, I recognize that some of you might be wondering why Centers of Bioethics would be hosting a seminar series for Black History Month, as opposed to, say, Departments of History or Social Studies. Well, two of the foundational principles of bioethics are justice and respect for persons. And sadly, the historical experience of black people in our country is replete with examples of disrespect and injustice. The failure of bioethics to acknowledge and address these problems is both inexplicable and unforgivable. Our ability to understand the sources of these injustices and lack of respect comes from an examination of history. And only by learning the lessons of this history can we hope to see the path forward a path towards greater equity and inclusion. So an understanding of black history is absolutely essential to the mission of bioethics. Let me now turn this over to my friend, colleague and co-host, Dr. Reuben Warren, director of the National Center for Bioethics and Research and, and Healthcare at T uh, Tuskegee University so that he can welcome you and introduce Professor Joan Reed, the moderator of this evening's session. Reuben? Good evening, and thank you, Bob. It is um, such a pleasure to once again see all the familiar faces and hear some new faces and hear some new voices. Dr. Carter G. Woodson was absolutely correct when he said that we need to take time to celebrate, to commemorate, and to reflect on things that are important. And while we do that every year, all the time, we pick out this month to target Black History Month. And one, as Bob said, why bioethics? Well, we're pushing the envelope. We're saying bioethics and beyond. We're even talking about a new framework called public health ethics, which talks about community engagement, benevolent, beneficence, and social justice. So this session is beyond the traditional boundaries we ask you to open up your minds and your hearts to what we ought to be doing uh, and reflect on what we've done. This is the time, and I'm excited for you to join us. And you've heard a moment ago about the friendships we share. And we're not talking about titles or positions. We're talking about friendships. And I'm so pleased that the moderator of this session is my dear friend for many, many years, uh, Dr. Joan Reed. 
And she's got enough titles and got enough things that we all know, Joan. But you need to know that she's the Dean of Diversity and Community Partnerships. And she's a full professor of internal, of internal medicine. So that's a really important thing for those in the academy. So do not belabor titles and, and, and positions. Let me turn it over to my dear friend, Joan Reed. Joan? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Warren. And thank you, Dr. Truth, um, for providing this session this evening and for providing me this opportunity to moderate. Um, it is always wonderful to be with your colleagues, your friends, and people um, that you think of as sheroes and heroes in the academy. So thank you for that. Um, I'm not going to go through long introductions. The bios of our three panelists can be found on the website and there's links to all of this. Our panelists are Dr. Lewis Sullivan, Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice, and Dr. I'm trying to find on my screen because I know him well, Dr. George Daly, the Dean of my school. Um, when I think about the three of you, I think about the, the many things that you share um, in your roles and your leadership roles, but you also share this really strong history with Boston in terms of your education, in terms of your training with Dr. Sullivan having graduated from Boston University School of Medicine, but also spent time in the Thorndike Lab, which was part of BU and Harvard. And Dr. Montgomery Rice, a graduate of Harvard Medical School, the same way as uh, Dean Daly, George Daly is a graduate of Harvard Medical School. But you also share something else in common. You're all three members of the National Academy of Medicine, but you're all members of the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine Roundtable on Black Men and Women in STEM. Uh, so very much relevant to this conversation this evening. And rather than talk about your many accolades and honors and all of your accomplishments, you're all three beyond accomplished. I'm hoping that you should share a different part of yourself and share with us briefly your own sort of early history, your personal or educational professional history and how it impacted you in terms of your perspectives about the conversation today, about the conversation about anti-racism, about equity and social justice, your perspectives from what you bring forward about creating real change in these areas. And I'm going to start with you, Dr. Sullivan. All right. Did you say Sullivan? Yes, I did. Oh, yes. Very good. Thank you. Well, first of all, it was a great pleasure to be with all of you this evening uh, and to be part of the panel and to really relate to the audience. But let me begin by uh, quote from perhaps the most famous Morehouse College graduate, there's Martin Luther King Jr. And many of you know, one of the things that he said is this, of all of the forms of inhumanity to man, perhaps access to healthcare differences are the most shocking and the most inhumane. And so that perspective uh, from one of our great moral leaders, I think uh, shows the importance of bioethics uh, when it comes to health care. Now, my personal story, I would summarize as follows. I'm a native Georgian. I was born at Grady Hospital, the big public hospital here in Atlanta, during the depths of the Depression, 1933. And because it was the Depression, my father, who was a life insurance salesman, was not selling much life insurance. So he moved our family. I was the younger of two boys. He moved us to Southwest Georgia when he went into the funeral home business. We really were poor, but we didn't know that because everyone else was like we were. And to make a long story short, my father established the first funeral home for African-Americans in the town of Blakely in Southwest Georgia. There was one black physician in that part of the state, Dr. Joseph Griffin in Bainbridge, 41 miles south. In those years of rigidly enforced segregation, if you were black and went to a white physician in Blakely, you had to go around back or enter differently. We resented that, as did many in the black community. So my father, with his ambulance service, uh, with his funeral home, frequently took blacks in uh, Blakely down to Bainbridge to Dr. Joseph Griffin, the one black physician in Southwest Georgia. 
Dr. Griffin was my role model because at age five, I told my parents, I want to be a doctor. I want to be like Dr. Griffin. That was because Dr. Griffin was obviously well-respected, very successful, very influential, and really had great knowledge. He could cure people of illness and injury. He could relieve their suffering. I wanted to have that capability of serving my fellow man. So he was my role model. Interestingly enough, many of you will know Dr. LaSalle LaFall, uh, who died uh, only a few years ago. LaSalle LaFall was trained by Charles Drew at Howard, and LaSalle LaFall became chairman of surgery at Howard University. Well, LaSalle came from Quincy, Florida. So I was in Blakely, 41 miles north of Bainbridge. LaSalle was in Quincy, Florida, some 20, 27 miles from Bainbridge. It turns out Dr. Griffin was his role model also. So he had great influence uh, on us. Well, in those years um, of segregation, schools for blacks in Georgia, and certainly in the rural areas, were really not very good. So my parents, being very committed to my brother and myself getting a strong education, sent us first to Savannah uh, for one year, then back to Atlanta after that to attend schools there. And while the schools were still segregated, they were much better. They were stronger. Uh, not only were the schools stronger, there was a strong middle class in Atlanta. So I got to know other Black physicians, lawyers, businessmen. And most of all, I learned about Morehouse College. So when I finished Booker Washington High School uh, in Atlanta, I enrolled at Morehouse College because I knew I wanted to be a physician. There, another role model uh, came into my view. That was Dr. Benjamin Mays, the president of Morehouse College. He had a remarkable story him himself, having been born in South Carolina in the town of 96. It had that name because the Highway 96 uh, ran through the town with one traffic light. He went to Bates College where he graduated in 1906, the one black in his class and val valedictorian in his class. He received his PhD in philosophy and religion from the University of Chicago. So in 1950, when I enrolled at Morehouse College, he had become president. He was eloquent, well-read, highly respected, always speaking to international bodies like the International Council of Churches, et cetera. And he told us the students, always aim to be the best in whatever field you choose. He said, because if you choose to be excellent, when they are considering someone in your field, they will have to consider you. Say, so, now you may not get the position, but it should not be because you're not qualified. Another saying he had was chance, favors the prepared mind, Francis Bacon. So he inspired all of us because all of us wanted to be like Dr. Mays. Well, we were encouraged um, uh, in 1953, our junior year, to not only to apply to Howard and Meharry, but to other medical schools as well. So I applied to a number of other schools and including Boston University. I was quite surprised that three weeks after I sent my letter in, I was hoping to be invited for an interview. I got a letter, I opened it very carefully and said, congratulations, you've been admitted to Boston University. So I had not gone for an interview. I had been interviewed locally in Atlanta by an alumnus of Boston University. So that's how I ended up at Boston University. In my class of 76 students in 1954, which is a year Brown versus Board of Education, I was the black student in my class, living for the first time in my life in an integrated environment. I wondered, how will I be received by my classmates and by the faculty? Will I be ignored? Will there be hostility? Well, we had our first examination three weeks after we had entered, and I did very well. Uh, and that allayed my questions as to whether my preparation really would be very good because my classmates had finished first or second in their class from Amherst or Williams or Harvard or Princeton or uh, elsewhere. So I uh, had a very good experience at Boston University, became class president, and then decided uh, in medical school 
that I wanted to become a hematologist. When I went to medical school, I didn't know what hematology was because my image had been to return to Georgia as a family physician. So when I finished um, BU, uh, I then went to Cornell. And in 1958 in New York City, again, the picture was repeating itself. The first black house officer at Cornell Medical Center uh, in New York, a most urban city in the country. And if you talk to um, um, anyone my age uh, who's African-American, you'll get a similar story of, the, of them being the first there because all of this is to say, we have made progress, but that progress has been very recent. And we need to do everything we can to really solidify that, that progress. So following that, I returned to Boston and after a year, uh, of pathology with Ben Castleman at Mass General. I went to the Thorndike and trained in hematology. And then I'd started my career in academic medicine. Wonderful. So so that is how I started. And the Dr. Final Sullivan, I want I want I want to say a piece because I'm gonna come I want to come back to pieces of this, but I'm hearing in what you're saying these recurring themes of first and 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 of stepping into places where um, you haven't been before. And as I think about some of the issues of today, as I think about the work that's being done by the round table, we still have our youth today who are stepping in as first and stepping into places where they wonder if they belong. Um, so when I think about someone like you who has done this and, and, and who opened the doors uh, for some of the, the rest of us, I wanna just stop mm -hmm. at this point and just say thank you for your role and what you've done in that. Um, I want to turn a little bit now to, to, to Dr. Montgomery Rice. And, and if you could share briefly part of what brought you to this place and why is this place to you important to you um, as we talk about anti-racism and as we talk about the importance of equity and social justice. So thank you, Joan and uh, Dr. Solomon, and Dr. Daly. It is such a pleasure to... Uh, be with you and Joan, excuse my familiarity, Dr. Reed. <laughs> You're on mute. You're on mute. I hear you. So, uh, you know, my story is one of how education is the great equalizer and the importance of mentorship and sponsorship, particularly for women and Black women in spaces that in the past have been really male dominated. Mm -hmm. My three sisters and I were raised by a single mother who whispered to us every night or so in our ears when she was coming off out of the swing shift from the seven to three, three to 11, 11 to seven, all things are possible. You can do anything you wanna do. You can be anybody you wanna be. Now we found it a nuisance for somebody to be tapping you on your ear when you were trying to sleep. And I know my mother did not know about subliminal messaging, but she did know about how to encourage her girls, whatever you wanted to term it. So my accomplishments have been the result of love and support. And I've been blessed to have such amazing mentors and sponsors that really saw my work and my work and guided me professionally. My primary mentor in my professional career really was there at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Ann Kiesling was the first woman to lead the Brigham's in vitro fertilization lab. And when I told her that I thought I wanted to be an REI, and I knew I had to do OBGYN first, but I really wanted to be an infertility specialist. And I came to her lab and said, you know, uh, I'm a Harvard medical student um, and I would like to do some research because I got to make my application more competitive four years from now. And she said to me, how much time do you have? And I said, I have three weeks. And she said to me, come back when you're serious. And that played out two or three times. And I ended up spending my entire fourth year of medical school <laughs> in a laboratory doing basic science research, which really was the foundation for my academic career. 
And so I got to watch her as a woman with four kids and we were always there on the weekend. And so were those kids. And we would have them doing crayons and we would have them doing projects or I would have them trying to help me go into the mouse room because I was scared of mice and they were not. And it was just a family affair of things. And she showed me what was possible, that you could be a mother, you could be a wife, you could have this outstanding career, but it required people who cared about you and who were willing to partner with you. So I've dedicated my career to helping women. And as a reproductive endocrinologist and fertility specialist, it's really always been about how we would advance health equity in that space because we know the disparities that were there. So equity, social justice, anti-racism, and healthcare are all intertwined. Black and brown people, indigenous people, poor people, and traditionally, they are traditionally underserved. And we need to change that because they need to achieve health equity. And health equity is not about giving people the same thing, guys. It is really about giving people what they need, when they need it, and the amount they need to reach their optimal level of health. And my career has been about me being fortunate enough to have people in my life <clears throat> at times giving me what I needed in the amount that I needed to re reach my optimal level self. My life's work has been dedicated to leveling the playing field. And it started early on by having a mother who, were will who was willing to make sacrifices for her girls so that we could reach our optimal presence. As I listen to you um, and as I listen to Dr. Sullivan, it is so very clear how those early experiences um, really guide and influence us as we move forward in our careers. Um, and hearing the role models at different points from the physician, LaSalle Fall and Lewis Sullivan, being the role model for both of them, the, this, this scientist and this physician at Harvard being this role model for you and this importance of, of role models, mentors, and others within our lives. Thank you both. Um, Dr. Daly, can you give your perspective? Yeah, Dr. Reed, let me just start by saying what an incredible privilege it is to serve on this panel with Dr. Sullivan and Dr. Montgomery Rice, um, and also what a privilege it has been and what a learning experience it has been for me to serve on the roundtable, um, Black men and Black women in STEM fields with Dr. Sullivan and Dr. Montgomery Rice, and, and I serve currently as a fellow dean of a medical school with uh, Dr. Montgomery Rice and, and count her among our tremendously distinguished graduates of, of Harvard Medical School. So this is just, this is really a thrill for me. I also learned something, you know, from Dr. Sullivan. Every time I hear him speak, I learn something. But, you know, we both trained as hematologists, but I learned that his father was a life insurance salesman. And um, that's another connection that we have because I grew up, my, my father was a traveling salesman. He sold ties and gloves all over the Northeast. And then later in his, um, he later on became a, a, a insurance salesman. And, and, you know, I think there's a good influence from a salesman in medicine uh, because my dad connected with people. He loved people. And, um, and he always reached out to people. And that, that was a value that I really treasure. I, I grew up in a small town in upstate New York, um, which actually had a multi-ethnic composition. It was relatively integrated. Um, but I have to say, uh, you know, very personally, I had uh, some very close dear relatives who were extraordinarily racist and classist. And I just remember from a very young age, feeling uncomfortable um, when, for instance, my uncle would uh, claim our superiority and our station in life based purely on our parentage and not on um, the content of our character, if you will. And I recall being viscerally 
just viscerally uncomfortable about that. Because deep down inside, I had friends whom I valued for their, their integrity, their work ethic, their humanity, um, their caring for others, the kind of, I think, values that led me in part to pursue a career in medicine. And, you know, those values that I, 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 I inculcated in, uh, in my experiences growing up um, helped shape me when, when I got to Harvard. Uh, coming from a small town where no, you know, very, like 10 or 15% of the kids went on to college at all, uh, I got to go to Harvard. But I remember as a freshman feeling that same awkwardness that I had felt from my uncle um, because Harvard was more segregated, more classist than um, even the small town that I had grown up in. So I think those early experiences did definitely shape me. And as I've adopted various roles throughout my academic career, whether it was running my own laboratory or running a small uh, clinical transplant division to now being Dean is that basically, I think it's the values that, that truly matter. And one of the key values um, is the importance of creating equal opportunities for everyone um, to flourish. Um, and that's something that I, I, I am still driving towards. Um, Dr. Reed, you're a tremendous partner uh, in my, my quest to do that on behalf of our community. Um, and, and I just think it's, it's part of what a, a great institution like uh, Harvard Medical School uh, should, be, should be advancing. It's a core principle to seek social justice, equal opportunity for all, so that all in our communities can flourish. Thank you. Uh, we carry our youth forward. You know, I'm a pediatrician, so this is all good to me. How we raise our children makes such a difference in this, in this world. Um, we, you all have this association with these institutions that have amazing histories, have important missions um, that are embedded in a society and a structure that was created um, with some of this injustice embedded in it, some of this racism embedded in it, some of these negative things. You look at some of the outcome from Flexner, et cetera, some very good things for academic medicine, some things not so good for others. Um, as you think about where we are now, and I want I want to take us to where we are in very current terms. We're in a time where if we look across our country, um, there's this sort of um, awakening for some, reawakening for some, and some of us have just been awake every day of our lives because we live being awake all the time. But we have institutions and places that are saying um, that you can't teach about racism, you can't teach about slavery. We have in the past 48 hours at our historically black colleges and universities experiencing bomb threats. So as we've moved forward, there's a part of us that is still carrying some of this history. And, and I'd like you to speak on that. I think that as, as much as we have this opportunity to talk about a mission and the work that we do and how we can work together to really counter racism, to also talk about what is happening in the news as we speak. Dr. Montgomery Rice, I wanna start with you. Thank you. Um, you are right, I, we are in the middle of this situation with um, the situation with the bomb threats. And, and someone asked me today, was I fearful? And I am reminded of a quote and I was trying to make sure I can remember it, that fear is just a call to exercise courage. Fear is just a call to exercise courage. And without fear, you can't have courage and without acting courageously and in a situation, you won't do that unless you have something to protect, something to honor, something to prove, something that you're committed to. Fear is that call to action and that action should be courageous. 
And so when I think about where we are right now and where we've come from since Flexner, now so Morehouse is the youngest of the, of the schools. So, you know, we were, we were one of the ones that were closed down or uh, disenfranchised with the Flexner report uh, during that time. And so we've had the opportunity to build upon the legacy of what's possible. And we have done that. And of course that was led by Dr. Lewis Sullivan, who was our president and Dean at that time. And so we've had this opportunity to continue to advance what's possible. And so when we find ourselves in this day and time, I think about being fearful, but it only makes me more courageous. And when I talk to my students and my faculty, I tell them that it is even more important for us to stand still and stand tall because this is our time to demonstrate to the world what it looks like to be advocates and champions of health equity. And no one said that that path would be easy. No one said that they had even seen the pathway to health equity. What I am also reassured though, and you talked about the awakening that people have had. There were many people who believed in the achievement of health equity, but they didn't quite know how to get there. And sometimes they were afraid, and I'm talking about institutionals and individuals with power, to be the first one up. And now I think they too are fearful for where we would be if we don't stand up. And we are seeing those institutions become courageous and say no more and declare anti-racism on their campus. They are talking and naming social injustices. They understand more clearly their commitment to people and understanding that when we take that oath, it is not about winning the prize or being just the best surgeon or all of the other accolades. It is about the people that we are going to be honored to impact and care for. Thank you. Dr. Sullivan, you, 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 you've had this amazing journey and, and I, You've got as far as part of what you were doing in terms of BU and your degree and then your training in Thorndike and other things, but and and the remarkable programs that you started at Western University. But as Dr. Montgomery Rice mentioned, you went to Morehouse and you started a Morehouse. And as I think about the challenges that we see today, um, why was there a need for a Morehouse? And as you look at what we're seeing today, is there a continued need for institutions such as Morehouse? I know that, that, that you are in the process of, of writing a book that speaks about our, our, um, our Black and minority health professional schools, but what led you to do that then? And what can we learn from what you did then that we can apply today? Well, first of all, I would say, <clears throat> I would certainly want to agree with Dr. Rice that we need to continue to plow ahead and, and not let uh, these threats of bombs, et cetera, deter us whatsoever. You think about um, what happened with W.B. Du Bois uh, and John Hope, who was president of Morehouse College in the early part of the 20th century. They worked to form the Niagara Movement, which was the predecessor of the NAACP. You think of people like... Um, Martin Luther King, um, uh, Reverend Lowry, and the others, uh, and people like James Meredith, who walked uh, uh, the highways of Mississippi in spite of many threats. You think of um, uh, Stephen, uh, Brian Stevenson in Montgomery, who has built this memorial to all of the lynchings that occurred, et, et cetera. So I think uh, all of us, in spite of these um, conditions, need to continue to, to push ahead. Let me say this. I ended up uh, as a research hematologist 
when in 1974, Morehouse College decided they wanted to start a medical school. And as an alumnus of the college, I was asked to serve on a, a committee of alumni who were in academic medicine to advise the college on this. I, we worked for a year. We thought, first of all, we were skeptical. But then by the end of this year, we were all enthusiastic. We thought that it was not only possible, but that it should be done. So Morehouse College undertook this and I was fortunate to then be asked to be the founding dean. And that gave me an opportunity because in essence for me, this meant the actual fulfillment of why I went to medical school in the first place. I went to medical school intending to be like Dr. Griffin. I ended up pushing vitamin B12 across cell membranes uh, and uh, looking at uh, uh, the effects of alcohol on blood cell production. And while that was very exciting and very productive, uh, starting the Morehouse School of Medicine was an opportunity for me to really return to Georgia through my graduates of the Morehouse School of Medicine and become those physicians in those medically underserved uh, areas. Because when my father took our family to Blakely, Georgia, he formed a chapter of the NAACP. He started an annual uh, Emancipation Day celebration January 1st of every year. He would have people like John Wesley Dobbs come to Blakely to urge the blacks to vote. He sued the school system because they were separate but not, not equal. So in, an, in essence, in addition to preparing me for a professional career, an educated career, my father and my mother were preparing me and my brother for careers as activists. So that's why I found the challenge and the opportunity of developing a predominantly black medical school to be very exciting. And the need for it is as follows. In 1950, 2% of America's physicians were African-Americans when we were 10% of the population. By the mid seventies, we were 12% of the population, uh, <clears throat> but only 3% of the physicians. Morehouse School of Medicine was founded um, uh, to really help address this, not by itself, but to help serve as a model for all medical schools to be much more active in becoming more diverse institutions and training their, their students. So the, the opportunity to do that was really a great sense of, of fulfillment. Now today, we still have only 8% uh, <clears throat> of today's medical students are African-American, although African-Americans are now 13% of the population. And we hope to have a society one day that it won't matter whether you're black, white, uh, red, yellow, or what have you. But, but we're not there yet. And we know that many people feel much more comfortable having a physician who understands them, their language, their culture, their value system, and who respects them as individuals. Because as I said, going, growing up in a segregated society, we had to accept uh, uh, the outer markings of this segregation, but we resisted it wherever we could. And that's how my father was always going down to Bainbridge, uh, taking people to see doc Dr. Griffin. So, so uh, we need to do everything we can to improve the health of our citizens. And part of that is having a more diverse uh, health workforce, not only in medicine, but in all of the health professions, in dentistry, nursing, uh, et, et, et cetera. And we also need to improve the health literacy of our, our populations uh, because we can really improve the health of our citizens in a, in a great way. The final comment I want to make, uh, because my friend Reuben Warren with his bioethics center there, Tuskegee, is involved, is this. One of our great educators was Booker Washington. Booker Washington, as you know, went to Tuskegee as a principal. Uh, and he built the science of that institution with George Washington Carver, the chemist uh, who changed the agricultural economy of the South through the products that he was able to develop with the peanut and the potatoes. And it really made the farmers much more ec economically viable uh, there. And, and George Washington Carver, of course, was a great scientist uh, coming out of uh, Simpson College in Indianola, uh, Iowa. And then going uh, after he received his PhD from Iowa State, going to uh, Tuskegee to form uh, that uh, science center. Booker Washington 
partnered uh, with uh, Julius Rosenwald. And many people don't know the story of Julius Rosenwald, who was head of Sears Roebuck, a, a catalog company. And living in Blakely, we ordered a lot of things through Sears catalogs. But Rosenwald worked with Booker T. Washington to form 5,000 schools for Blacks, elementary schools and high schools that didn't exist in many of these communities. Uh, and there are many people today whose education came, uh, occurred in these Rosenwald schools. So fundamentally, we have had predecessors who faced odds much more challenging than the odds we have today. And I say our job and our challenge is to continue to move forward because what we are trying to do is to realize the meaning of the Declaration of Independence of all men being created equal and we're working towards a more perfect union in our society. We're not that, we've never been a perfect union, but we're moving toward it. So what we're doing uh, in our activities is trying to help all of us working together, black, white, yellow, what have you, to work together and get beyond these prejudices that really have some people uh, who feel threatened by people who are not like them uh, and carry out these acts of bombings and intimidation, but it's not going to work because we're not intimidated. We're going to continue to move forward and we're going to make this country live up to the full meaning of its destiny. That's why I'm pleased to be doing what I'm doing. And that's why my early life shaped my career uh, where I ended up training more young people uh, not only who are African-American, because Morehouse School of Medicine has always been integrated from the beginning. We've had white students. We've had uh, uh, students uh, from abroad. Uh, we've had uh, Chinese students, et cetera, because everyone needs health care. And our purpose is to really see that people get the services that, that they need. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. When, um... And I'm going to ask you, Dr. Daly, to, to, as we talk about these incidents and what's going on today, what is the role for a Harvard Medical School in this? What is the role for predominantly white institutions in this space? Um, and, and part of what comes to mind is, 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 as Dr. Sullivan is talking is this idea and concept and what Harvard's doing around this better together, that, that we can't do this alone. HBCUs can't do this alone. Could you give the, the Harvard perspective on, on, on what we're seeing and what's happening? Yeah, let me say, I think that um, Harvard has um, a particular prominence in our society uh, and coming with that, uh, that prominence is the responsibility, uh, the responsibility to react and to also lead. Um, you know, I'm incredibly proud that Harvard Medical School can be the, the school that attracts the most outstanding students and then goes on and, and then they go on and they become remarkable leaders uh, like Dr. Montgomery Rice. Um, so we have a, we have we play a really, really critical role in in shaping the highest standards of academic achievement. And so one of the things that we really think we have to do as a predominantly white institution is make sure that we are taking advantage of all the opportunities and giving those opportunities in a more equitable manner. And so I've, I say this in part, uh, Dr. Reed, because I'm really, really, um, I want to applaud so many of the things that you've done as a leader at Harvard Medical School and a leader nationally especially in the way that you've built these incredible pipeline programs. Because I think the pipeline programs are going to lift people and give them opportunity so that they can carry the banner of Harvard and be leaders across the country. I think about the way that you bring um, high school students and undergraduates to our community for uh, a weekend of intense immersion in science through the Biomedical Sciences Careers Program, an immersion in mentorship. Um, many of those students have gone on to careers 
in biomedicine. Um, you know, you've created um, the Hinton Scholars Program that has served, you know, almost 1500 students since 2003. You've created this visiting clerkship program where we get outstanding students, many of whom from the historically black colleges, universities, historically black medical schools, coming to the Harvard system to do their clinical clerkships, to realize that they can seek opportunities in our fantastic hospitals to become leading, uh, leading physicians. Um, it's a start. It's one way that Harvard, which is an incredibly privileged community, can open its arms and be welcoming uh, and then, then create the kinds of opportunities that lead to leadership. Um, and, and the reason that I'm so proud of, of the so many leaders that we have trained who have been driving diversity across uh, biomedicine. Thank you. When, when um, you think about where we are now and I'm, and I'm looking at the time and we're gonna open it in, in a few minutes for those of you who have questions to put them into Q&A. Um, are there things that we can do together? Our historically black colleges and universities are predominantly white institutions across institutions to address these issues of what I call try, trying to intimidate issues of racism, um, issues such as a round table that's looking at issues around diversity and equity and inclusion, which then means you also have to address some of the social determinants and education and access for the members of our community. Are there things that we could do together that, that your institutions may have, been take, have taken on themselves and you could tell us about those, but also where we could partner in moving these forward. And I'm again, start with you, Dr. Montgomery Rice. Thank you, Joan. So, you know, I uh, have always been the person who said, okay, I'm gonna stick with what our expertise is. And our expertise at Morehouse School of Medicine is educated and training culturally competent providers. And so lots of people have always said, well, if you really want to increase the number of students and students of color go into medical school, why don't you open up another black medical school? Well, I, my answer to that was most schools have a, in their mission somewhere, diversity. So first of all, why don't we hold everybody accountable to what their mission said? But then when I think about what we could do at Morehouse School of Medicine, what we recognized was that we really have been very successful at this. We've grown our class size at Morehouse School of Medicine over the last 10 years. Uh, we doubled the class size, but we could do more. And so last year we announced a partnership with Common Spirit Health, the largest not-for-profit health system in the country. The CEO and I, Lloyd Dean decided that we could do something right now that could make a difference. And so we're on a journey to open up five regional medical campuses with Morehouse School of Medicine at Common Spirit sites. We picked naive sites, naive to undergraduate medical education and GME, and many of them will be rurally focused or in towns and areas where there is an access challenge. And we're gonna open up 10 graduate medical education programs with no less than three disciplines. And as we grow, Morehouse School of Medicine will become 225 students who will be hopefully, 50% of them will be recruited from those communities through our pipeline programs. And eventually they're gonna find their way back to those communities where they graduated from high school, where their mother is working on a paper factory, or their grandmother was cleaning somebody's house. And they're going to see their loved one having been able to experience what's possible because of the foundation. Now, that was two CEOs, myself and another CEO, who runs the largest not for profit health system in this country saying we can do something now and we are well on our way for success. 
And so I think that what people have to become is very intentional and understand what their responsibility is with the resources that they are asked to steward, how to leverage them for transformation, not just change, but transformation while they are sitting in the seat. Be intentional, intentionable, and be actionable. Thank you. Dr. Daly, can you talk a little bit about this space of what we could do together? Well, I'd be very receptive to any of a number of creative ideas. I'm very excited by the fact that Dr. Trug, who runs our Center for Bioethics, is closely connected to Dr. Warren and Tuskegee. And that's, a, that's a, just a, a perfect example of the way we can come together around critical issues, uh, academic and, and otherwise. I also think, you know, in our own communities, um, Harvard Medical School is trying to make a greater effort to reach out uh, and engage and be more socially responsible. We saw in the COVID era, especially with the, uh, the disparities in just vaccination and also the access to the trials of vaccines that uh, the leadership of our trials actually ended up coupling to the community health centers in order to uh, recruit a more diverse population in those trials so that we could have a better understanding of the function of the vaccine. Um, I'm very excited by the recent development of the Office for Community-Centered Medical Education that has sprung up uh, in our Center for Primary Care. The goal being to engage our medical students more in the communities, to have their educational experiences be um, be, be, be really just immersed in the communities of color around Boston uh, who will be benefited so much by the, the presence of our medical students and our medical students will benefit so much from the enriched learning experiences that, that they'll gain there. So I think we need to work together as institutions, but I think we also need to come together as communities. And, and I'm certainly hoping that we can continue to do that at, at Harvard. Thank you for that. I think about, as we come together for communities, I think about our work with the Health Equity Compact and our work with King Boston and community-based organizations and where we partner with those organizations. Um, I have a slightly different question, go down this path of, of, and, and want to put this to you, Dr. Sullivan. Um, is, what do you think are some of the remaining larger barriers for our black community as we think about the next generation? What are some of the things we need to address and remove as we look forward, um, the students of tomorrow? I think the major barriers uh, are as follows. First of all, the income or the wealth of uh, black, the average black, black family is really minimal. We need to do everything we can uh, to provide financial resources for these young people if they are to realize their dream of going to college, going to professional school, et, et, et cetera. Uh, one of the things that has been rather encouraging to me has been the virtual spontaneous uh, actions of a number of people in the last 18 months uh, to the COVID pandemic um, uh, as well as the unfortunate police uh, incidents around the country, where we've seen people like Mackenzie Scott uh, give major grants to more than 21 black colleges, um, uh, grants of 20, 40 million dollars, et cetera. Uh, the Hastings uh, of Netflix, uh, similar dollars to places like Morehouse College and Spelman, et, et, et cetera. And then, of course, the $100 million that Michael Bloomberg gave to the four Black medical schools. Those are remarkable, but those by themselves are not, uh, not enough. What I would like to see is a, something to continue this culture of giving that we've seen and have it continue not for a year or two, but for a decade or two or more. And I happen to be a member of a council of past presidents of black colleges that's here in Atlanta, some 19 of us. And we've been talking about this. If we could 
really see that the resources come to black colleges that they never have had, uh, that uh, they could do a much uh, more robust job in preparing young people for careers, whether it's in medicine, law, business, or, or, or what have you. So that's one thing. The other thing I would suggest is this, I think our institutions can work closely together. Back in 1977, uh, I, I was involved in forming the Association of Minority Health Profession Schools, which at that time included Meharry Medical College, Tuskegee Veterinary School, Xavier College of Pharmacy, Morehouse School of Medicine. Uh, and we then grew to 12 institutions, which are all four of the black medical schools, the two dental schools, the veterinary school at Tuskegee, and the uh, seven colleges of pharmacy. This association has worked on a number of things and really in, in a sense like Julius Rosenwald and the great work that he's done, the Association of Minority Health Profession Schools is not well known. Well, we've written a history of that association which will be coming out this fall from Johns Hopkins Press because many people don't know the National Institute for Minority Health and Health Disparities exists because of the activities of this association. There's a research endowment program that exists because of that. There's the RCMI program that came into being because of the work that, that, that we did. So that's one example of institutions working closely together. And the other comment I would make is this, in 1968, while I was in Boston as professor of medicine at Boston University, we worked with Harvard, Tufts, Dartmouth, and Vermont, Brown and the University of Massachusetts to work to recruit more black students to our medical schools. This was following the unfortunate assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. And many of you remember that around the country, colleges and universities were trying to think what can, could they do uh, in response to that. So these medical schools came together. We had a recruitment weekend. We brought 24 students, black students, from 24 black colleges in the South to urge them to apply to our medical schools and to go back to their colleges and encourage their friends to apply. So, so that was the Thanksgiving weekend, 1968 in Boston. The following year in 1969, Harvard, I think had some 11 black freshmen. Boston University had six. Every one of these schools that participated in this week, weekend when we worked together, uh, in our recruitment uh, activities. Every school except for Vermont had more black students. Larry McCrory, who is an African-American physiologist at the University of Vermont, was disappointed, but it was not his fault. I think the students who came thought that Vermont and the North Pole were the same place, and therefore they didn't do, do, do so well. But so I think that activities uh, that we can combine in educating young people, is mentoring them, counseling them, uh, because if they end up going to Pittsburgh uh, or to San Diego uh, or to Miami, University of Miami, that's, that's okay. We want to have them in the health professions. So I think we could work together in helping to lift the spirits and the sights of many young people, whether it's in Boston or in Baton Rouge. So I, I would like to see us uh, working together on things like that, I think would have a major impact in broadening the pool of students coming into our schools. Actually collaborating and working together um, to bring more, more forward. Um, it, one of the issues that it's come up in, in parts of the questions the chats and one of the issues we often hear about are issues around literacy and the quality of the education that our, our students are receiving and, and its impact it impacts their health status um, and low education and job opportunities, but it also impacts their um, entry into our profession and moving forward in these spaces. Is there a role for our academic centers in our communities to think about or address issues of literacy for, be it for patients, be it for the students in the schools and the educational system? Uh, I'll, I'll start because Morehouse School of Medicine, seven years ago, adopted the Tuskegee Airmen Global Academy. It's a K through five uh, school that is about 
five hours at the most from the school. And up until COVID, we have 130 of our employees who are certified to go into the school for active engagement with the students. Four times a year, we bring the entire population of the school, 600 students, to the school and engage with them in an activity. There's mentorship that's ongoing. At the beginning of uh, every school year, or right before it begins, we do a strategic planning session with the student, with the teachers. What are we focusing on this year? Is it reading? Is it math? Is it third grade reading? Is it fifth grade math? Whatever it is. And that's what, when we go into those schools, that's what our focus is on, right? When we are interacting with those students. Our students have won the state science fairs for their grade level. We built them a robotics laboratory. We do all type of science projects in a group manner. We have music programs. We have a um, robotics team that has gone to uh, championships. And all of this is because we understand that we have to make this investment now for what may happen 20 years from now. And it's, a, it's, it's just a partnership and that school was at the bottom when we started. And I know it wasn't just us, but our influence and our impact of our 130 or 50 employees and all of our students who are engaged there, they will tell you made a difference. And now that, student, that school is a much higher functioning school. And we believe that we are making a difference by investing early on. Thank you. Dr. Daly. Well, I, I um, am reminded of some of the research that uh, was shared with the roundtable by Raj Chetty, one of our economists of uh, disparities and inequality at, at Harvard, who has probably done more than any other economist to shed light on mm -hmm. the challenges of, of, of our society that start very, very young. Um, and that the disparities start with access to, you know, pre, preschool, preschool education. Um, disparities in access to childcare and the burden that childcare places and the, the, the challenge of uh, having any of our young people achieve their, um, their, their ultimate uh, capabilities uh, if they can't also have society take some responsibility to educate and care for our children. So I think we uh, leaders of these institutions uh, we can advocate very strongly for the importance of universal uh, preschool, uh, the importance of expanded childcare. I mean, most most uh, societies uh, in the, the most sort of enlightened societies realize that by providing access to early education and childcare, it lifts everyone's capabilities and it improves the general lot economically, intellectually. And I, I think we have a stronger voice to, to, to be heard there. Thank you. I, I think that the part of what we bring in terms of our research, our knowledge building, our exploring different areas, um, but you didn't say it. I think the other part, and, and it's much like you, uh, Dr. Montgomery Rice, there's other ways in, that are, are concrete. For Boston Public Schools, part of the AP biology students and their teachers actually do their classes at Harvard Medical School. And so yeah. I, I think there's a part of this that's just the concrete and on the ground. Yeah, we, you we have, yeah, you're talking about MedSci, right? This MedSci program was part of it, which is an unbelievable and exciting program that I've taught in. We have students taking physiology at Boston high schools who then come to the campus in a simulation lab and they're put through the same kind of rigors as you know our emergency room physicians are to see a, you know a patient. The patient is actually a a, a mannequin, but mm -hmm. uh, there's someone behind the screen that's answering the students' questions in real time, and they walk them through a real clinical engagement. I think it's inspired our students to go into into healthcare, 
uh, or high school students. But it's got to start earlier than that. You know, I, I think that it, there's, there's so much time lost between the early days and, and, and by the time we get to high school, we really need to be enriching educational opportunities across the board. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sullivan, as you have had these roles with the Secretary of, of Health and, and starting medical schools and being on this round table in so many different places and so much influence in different places, your thoughts in terms of where we can step in around these issues of literacy and the education of our youth and, and how we are or are not preparing them? Well, I certainly want to agree with uh, Dean Daly's uh, comments um, that we need to have the help of economists and others. Um, and one uh, other example I would like to add uh, is, is that um, of um, uh, James, um, well, his name is uh, James Coma at Yale, child psychiatrist, African-American. Jim Coma for years has worked uh, to improve the functioning of inner city schools and he's developed what's called the Coma Method and uh, working uh, to really turn failing schools in the K through 12 system into successful schools. Uh, I don't know all of the things that are involved in, in that, but I think we need to do everything we can to encourage the replication of programs like that uh, because as um, uh, George said, it'll lift everything in, in, our, uh, in our communities. So because the problem all of us struggle with is the pipeline is narrow when it comes to students coming into our health profession schools. We need to broaden that pipeline. We need to get those youngsters in the fourth and fifth grades when they're thinking about uh, what they will be when they grow up, when they imagine themselves uh, doing something, when they will begin to work towards that. So if we could really get them while they really uh, are excited and keep them excited and stimulated, I think that will really uh, be a great contribution that we'll make not only to the health professions, but to our societies uh, in general. So I think what we have to do is be broad citizens. We have to be health professionals and health educators and researchers, but we have to be citizens to see that all aspects of our society where we are privileged, but we need to be sure that others get the privileges that we enjoy. Uh, and in, in so doing, I think we'll make a tremendous contribution. So that's a challenge I think we, we confront. Thank you. And, and, and so, as you know, I said before, as a pediatrician, agree, if I could start in utero, I'd start in utero and I'd start with women's health as we think about our, our children and, and, and their future. But and also you know, how I do we believe, uh, read, Joan, you know, I believe you can start in utero, right? So yeah. uh, I really think that an environment support. where those babies are uh, matters. We talk, we talk to women about reading to their babies, yeah. decreasing their stress, creating an environment that is comforting. And you talk about the microaggressions that women experience. We, know, we believe that does influence what is happening and perhaps transcends to what you know mechanisms of fight and flight that baby is going to be born with. And so I think it does begin in utero. And I think we need to be cognizant of that, as you know, uh, as a as a women's advocate and reproductive endocrinologist, I talk a lot about maternal mortality and infant mortality, and we have to have a prevention and wellness strategy around that. And once those babies are born, though, we then have to wrap them in the same type of care and protection that we want them to have in the, in utero, and we cannot be hypocritical about it. So when we sit here and talk about we are, uh, want to be pro-life. The people say they want to be pro-life. Pro-life doesn't just mean keeping the baby in utero. It means advocating for that life once that baby is born. And so you talk about pre-K, that ought to be just standard. And anything else that a child needs to be successful in this country. And I'm gonna say, and it extends from there all the way Amen. through. So as you talk about the middle school programs and we talk about high school and we talk about this continuum along these multiple paths that our students can, can follow. Um, part of what has come in here is we started to talk about some of these social determinants of health. We started to talk about issues of health 
disparity. And as I look at some of the questions that have come in, one of them is around um, thoughts and insights about how we address these health disparities and how African-Americans specifically is that can effectively start to address health disparities and improve health. So not only what can we do as system and do our research, but what can African-Americans themselves do to um, improve the health of our families and our communities? Dr. Sullivan. Well, I think uh, I agree. We need to improve the health literacy in our population. And the pandemic has shown this in spades because we, here we have the, the paradox of ha having developed tremendous vaccine uh, for this new virus within a year of its appearance uh, with remarkable results, remarkable effectiveness. But the problem we've run into is a lot of people don't trust the science or don't trust the administration uh, uh, of it. And so, uh, so I have been rather surprised and disappointed that a public health issue has become a political uh, issue. So, so I think we need to really work to improve the level of comfort and trust in our general society, in our healthcare system. Uh, so that's a responsibility that, that, that we have because I was in medical school when Salk developed the polio vaccine. Uh, that changed the picture of polio overnight. In 1956, we had people at the Haynes Hospital there in Boston in iron lungs, helping them breathe to keep them alive. The Salk vaccine uh, came along the following year. There were only one or two cases. We changed the culture then because with the polio epidemics, Mothers wouldn't let their children play with their fr friends right on the street. Uh, they wouldn't let them go swimming, et cetera. But the sock vaccine changed this. So we've had remarkable advances in science, but the level of trust in science somehow has been eroded. So we have to work on that. Improving the health literacy in our uh, uh, citizens, I think, is where we would start. Thank you. Um, John, I, did you? I, I, yeah. mm -hmm. No, I was I'm, coming I'm, to you next, so perfect. Oh, okay, all right. I, I was going to address a similar issue, but hmm. no, no, please, please address that. And but I want to add another piece to this because we haven't talked about a part of it. So addressing that in terms of the, the science and where we've been excellent and where we have not hit the mark. But can you also talk a little bit? And I'm going to ask you. To, to, to talk about what did we do with our medical students so that they don't do the same thing that we've done? Are we teaching them differently or training them or educating them in different ways to be aware of things that we might not have been aware of? And I think about everything from the racism and how this structural racism and, and how it's embedded in medicine. And um, so a part of what we're doing well, what we've done well and where we're missing out, but also how are we teaching our students so that they'll do better? Yeah. Uh, oh, wow, that is such an important issue. Um, so, you know, let me, let me first sort of as a segue from, from the earlier question is to recognize that, you know, physicians can be remarkable agents of social justice. Um, and I think we have a responsibility. Everyone interacts with a doctor at some point. Um, and, and medicine should be a force for democratization and, and equality. Um, but in order to get that, we really need physicians who can reflect the diversity of our community, right? We need physicians who can relate to the lived experiences of the, the people that we serve. And so we, we have uh, taken a deep dive in our medical education program. We had a anti-racism task force led by um, Andrea Reed, who is our associate dean for the Office of Recruitment and Multicultural Affairs and Fidencio Saldana is our dean of students. And that was a phenomenal analysis of the whole spectrum of medical education at Harvard from admissions to recruitment to the nature of the curriculum um, and in the analysis, we realized that we have to really change the way we teach. We have to let all students, students of color, 
students uh, from different backgrounds have to understand the deeply entrenched concerns of racism in our society. We know that black men are more amenable to preventive care when they're seen by black doctors, right? Black women are three times more likely to die after giving birth than white women. Black infant mortality is, is cut in half when they're cared for by a black doctor. We know that pain is undertreated in black Americans relative to, to white Americans. So we need to teach medical students to recognize disparities and to be advocates for change. And John, if I can add to this. So Morehouse School of Medicine is one of the four historically black medical colleges, right? And so people think that, okay, oh, we got it wrapped up in the bag. We have it all together. We don't. So we just hired our first chief diversity, inclusion and belong, okay, leader, right? And the reason for that is because inclusion matters so much. The sense of belonging. And just because somebody looks like you sometimes, that doesn't mean that they're going to be inclusive or you are going to have this sense of belonging. And so we are all a work in progress. I think the most important thing is, again, being courageous and recognizing and naming the challenge, naming the problem, and then framing a solution that is guided by the diverse thought based on diverse people's experiences to create the richest solution. Welcoming people to the table and people not being afraid to voice some of their inadequacies of not understanding, of voicing what George said early on. I know that there were racists in my family or people who didn't think about people with the level of care. And I was uncomfortable with that. All of us know that, right? All of us had this, whether you were black or white or Mexican or Asian, all of us had this. But are we courageous enough to have that conversation and to say how that may have influenced or biased how we see people, how we treat people, how we care for people? Once we get it out there, we can then collaboratively come up with a solution that can change minds and change hearts and end up positively impacting the people that we are here to serve. Thank you. I, I, as, as we are nearing um, our time when we are gonna have to, to end our session, I'm struck by the importance of our understanding ourselves, our history, and our how we were raised and our own values and what we bring, part of what you were just talking about, um, and, and how that influences our decisions every day and our actions every day. But it's so seldom that we reflect. And there are so few spaces to have the kind of dialogue that you mentioned. And as I look out, I see so much dissension. I see so much fear of sharing and, and of, of, of am, I, am I saying it the right way or how will it be interpreted right. or, or, or jumping to assumptions that ends the conversation and our ability to move forward. Three of you are leaders who, who have to lead, have led and are leading organizations where dialogue is so important, where it is so important for us to create this space for conversations, honest dialogue, where people can bring their authentic selves and transparency. Can you talk about part of this? Because it's a, an issue in our institutions. It's an, it's, it's an issue in our nation of being able to have these conversations. And just some of your take, I don't think you have magic bullets, but this is such a critical um, juncture in time and such an important issue for all of us. How do we not just talk to people who look like, sound like, think like ourselves, but expand that? Um, 
Dr. Daly. Well, I have to say, as I'm reflecting on listening to Dr. Sullivan and Dr. Montgomery Rice, that uh, how humbled I feel uh, at how much I've learned just from what they've said, what a what compelling communicators they are. You know, I think that someone like me in my role has to be willing to admit uh, their own ignorance, their own inadequacy, uh, my own vulnerability, especially around these very sensitive issues. Um, I'm still, I'm still learning, and I hope I'm still growing, and I hope I'm still um, working towards becoming a better person, a better leader, someone who understands the struggles, uh, many of the struggles that we've been speaking about uh, this evening. Um, so I, I, will, I won't stop trying to uh, articulate the values that I think our community should be driven by, and those values include social justice and equal opportunity for all. Um, I, I just think that we have to be willing to acknowledge the struggle and bring together our community. Uh, because if we are, well, to, to use your phrase, Dr. Reed, we are better together. We're better when we work together. Thank you. And, and Dr. Reed, I will say that the influence um, that shapes us into who we are and how we see people comes from many places and spaces and in, in many colors. So many people would believe that I went into OBGYN reproductive endocrinology because of some great experience. And I did have great experiences with women, but it was really, really a white male at Harvard Medical School, Dr. Isaac Schiff, who is the kindest person in America, okay? No doubt about it. <laughs> and he told me something early on. He said, presume good intent until somebody proves it otherwise. Okay, good intent. And that's what he is, all, that's what he did. That's how he lived his life. That's how I saw him all the time, good intent. And then the second person who affirmed for me that I had gone into the right specialty was another white man, John Thompson at Emory University at Grady Hospital. He wrote to Lynn's textbook. He never walked into a patient's room without knocking on the door first. He never touched a patient before saying, Mrs. Jones, may I grab your hand? Mrs. Jones, may I examine you first? It was that bedside manner and that care regardless of who that patient was, that level of respect that was provided and given. He saw the humanity of those persons, both Dr. Schiff and Dr. Thompson. And that's why I knew that I had gone into the right profession. Those were the people who I wanted to emulate. And so what I would say to people is, look around and give people the opportunity to show you who they really are. And you will be surprised at how much you will learn and how much people want to hear if we give them the space to do so. Thank you. As we, before I turn this back over to Dr. Truth and Dr. Warren, um, I'd like to turn to you, Dr. Sullivan, um, and your wisdom and your thoughts about how we, move forward um, as individuals, as, as organizations, how do we create the space to be better than we have been, to be better than we are now, um, to, to communicate better, to give better care, um, to address these issues that have plagued our country for so very, very long. Dr. Sullivan, last word, and then Dr. Truth and Dr. Warren. Well, I think we need to be inspired by those who have come before us and follow their examples. Because I think uh, both Dr. Bailey and, and Dr. Montgomery Rice have said it very well. None of us uh, is a perfect being. We all have our faults. We all have our deficiencies. 
But what we need to do is recognize those many positives that, that we exist in others and reach out and have that as a bridge. So that um, uh, my goal is to really work to see that I'm a better person tomorrow than I am today. To see that my community is a better community tomorrow than it is today in my country. You remember I said, we are working towards a more perfect union, though we've never had that, but I haven't lost faith in that possibility. So I think if we keep that commitment, we'll get to where we want to go. It'll take a lot of work, but I think we're prepared to do it. And I'm encouraged by this discussion because that shows that we have the fortitude, we have the commitment, we have the desire to be a better country, to be a better person. And we as individuals who have enjoyed the opportunities that this country has, in spite of the many obstacles, we need to enlarge those opportunities for everyone and, and, and understand that when we create opportunities for other people, we don't lose anything, we gain. The, the people who are doing the bombings and the threats, those are people who don't understand that if they embrace their brother rather than reject their brother, they enjoy a better life, they enjoy a better community. So that's what we have to do. We have to continue to reach for the beloved community. And we as the physicians have a major role to play. We have an exalted position in our society because of what we provide for what uh, the integrity and the honesty that we should have when we are at our best, we need to continue that. And the final comment I would make is this. We've had tremendous development of our science and our technology, and we want that to continue, but we don't want that to sideline us. We have too many instances of really becoming captured by our technology. Walking into a patient's room, looking at our computer rather than looking at the patient. We need to be sure we preserve the humanism in medicine, because I often say that medicine and the other health professions are science-based, but they operate in a social setting. So that means we need both the science and the humanism to be an effective professional and to provide the best services. If we keep that balance uh, in mind, we will uh, become a better society. That's the challenge that we have and to op open the opportunities for everyone, this will make things better, not only for those who g gain those opportunities, but for those of us who really have been advantaged by our system as it is now. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. Thank you, Dr. Montgomery Rice. Thank you, Dr. Daly. Um, this has been inspiring. Um, I've learned a lot. Um, I am so proud to be a physician. I'm so proud of our um, what we have done and what we can do moving forward. I am so happy that I can call you my friend. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank and now you. Dr. Trug and Dr. Warren. Yeah, just, just to say, but it's been a, a gift and a privilege to be able to be a part of this conversation. And I, I, I hope you'll take a moment to look in the chat box. Uh, there's so many people that have expressed that, uh, that view. It's really, uh, can't, can't say how much we thank you for, for what you've done here. So, uh, and thank you to the, for the participants too, who, who uh, participated as well. And, and I know you weren't able to see all the comments and stuff, but uh, the questions and things you asked were, were very helpful. So good night. And I hope to see everybody uh, in the Wednesdays to come. Dr. Warren, anything to add? Simply to say you all are talking ethics because you live in it. And so when somebody says, I'm an ethicist, ask them if they're living it. This has been a fantastic opportunity and I couldn't be more pleased and more proud. And we had three uh, guest speakers, but we had a fourth and that was Joan Reed. So let's not get it twisted. We had a wonderful opportunity. So thank you, Joan. And thank you, Dr. Sullivan, Dean Bailey and President Montgomery Rice. This has been a wonderful, wonderful evening. And of course, my dear friend and colleague, Bob Drew. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you all for doing this. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Bye-bye.